Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Worcester Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Pat Agar, and I'm your chair today. Alongside me, we have our council officers, uh, Mr. Paul Round, who will be presenting a lot of what's said, uh, the, the applications today. Mr. Duncan Rudge, who is the head of service. Ms. Laura Wall over there. Ms. Georgina Coley is our legal representative. And we have over here our other officers uh, who will be recording the, uh, the proceedings. Oh, Ms. Karen Hanchett is a representative from County Highways. So this is a public meeting and members of the public and press are permitted to report on proceedings. Reporting includes filming, photographing, making an audio recording and providing commentary on the proceedings. Please note that this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent to being filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you have left the building, the assembly point is in the high street opposite the Guild Hall. All emergency, oh sorry, I've said that, haven't I? Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. Thank you. So I'd like to open the meeting now with the appointment of substitutes. Thank you, Chair. Today we have councillors, Mrs Lucy Hodgson for Councillor Cleary, Councillor Stanley for Councillor Mitchell, and Councillor Stephen for Councillor Louie. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, moving on then to item two, declarations of interest, please. Right, in regard to item eight, I'm part of the um, conservation advisory panel that did actually have a meeting at this premises, which was um, a really impressive experience, to be honest. Um, but I did receive tea and biscuits while I was there. And uh, although I don't consider that it could affect um, the application here, the same day that we had that meeting, the application for this came in. So I just needed to bring that to your attention. Thank you. I don't think tea and biscuits constitute a bribe, so I think we'll pass over that. Thank you. Uh, on um, to the applications this afternoon, uh, I'm going to declare an interest. The first one being in the Palisades uh, application. One of the uh, principal objectors is known to me and is more than just a general, uh, just a, a general acquaintance. So I'll be, um, I won't be contributing to the debate um, and I'll withdraw, but I will be speaking for local residents. Uh, on the other Batten Hall um, application, 220 London Road, I've been quite, uh, I've had quite a lot of contact with case officers and also local residents. Unfortunately, I've sort of been drawn into a little bit of a negotiation on some of the parts of the, uh, of the application. And as such, uh, I've been given some advice that uh, I, it's not prudent for me to take part in the debate or the vote on that. But again, I will be speaking for local residents and then leave the room. Thank you, Louis. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my um, well, like Jenny, I, I was present at the same meeting of the, Conser of the Conservation Advisory Panel at Batten Hall up the Mount. Is that the right terminology? Um, but I got there too late for team visits. <laughs> I just thought I ought to mention it because Jenny was mentioning it. I thought I should. Anyone else? I'm, I'm part of the conservation advisory panel, but I wasn't there at the meeting. Thank you. Right. The chance to read the minutes. Yeah. Are there any matters arising from those minutes? 
No, let's go through it briefly. Uh, page one, page two, page three, page four. Can I sign those as a true and accurate record? Thank you. You've all received the minutes of the conservation advisory panel. Everybody happy to receive those? Thank you. Uh, I should mention that we made, a, some of us made a site visit to the St. Placides site, which is item eight this morning. Uh, so we did have an opportunity to see pretty much exactly what was going to go on. So, uh, and that was quite useful. Okay, moving on from that then, uh, I think we do, do we have any public participation? No public participation, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. I note that we do have public representation, uh, and that is on this item, I think, isn't it? Looking for mine. Yes, it's on this item. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Bayliss and Mr. Pegg to this committee. And uh, if you'd like to come forward uh, to the microphone, both of you. Yeah, I know. I'll just explain that. What will happen next is uh, Mr. Round will present the application and then you will have a chance to tell us your side of, of the story. Okay? Thank you. Screen. And um, the slideshow view, please. Seems to be having issues with my clicker. Can I turn it off? Turn it back on again. Are you, are you able to just to advance the slides as I? Yeah, right. First slide, then, please, Margaret. Well, members, this application relates to the site of the former Placides School, which is situated on the southwest of the city centre on Batten Hall Avenue. It is situated within the Batten Hall Villas conservation area. The building is not statutorily or locally listed. Next slide, please. The building has been heavily extended in the past that reflects its former use as a junior school. And although allocated for green space within the South Worcestershire development plan, the rear of the site is dominated by a hard surface play space. The application site is located opposite Mount Batten Hall Mount, a grade two star listed building that has been converted and is in the process of being converted by the applicant to care accommodation. Now I've got some photos of the site. Next slide. So this is looking up the drive towards the building and you'll see the cedar of Lebanon tree in the foreground. Next slide. And the building itself. And again. This is looking towards the residential properties to the left-hand side boundary um, and we're into the hard surface play space. Next slide. That's again looking further from the play space back towards the bungalows and the properties. Next slide. And again, there's quite a few Margaret, I'm afraid, so just keep going and I'll... So this is looking to the other boundary with the neighbouring property which fronts onto um, Battenhall Avenue. Next slide. That's looking to the rear of the site um, from the, 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 the main boundary looking back down to the, the properties to the rear. Next slide. looking at the trees to the rear of the site and you can see that was the original picture was looking through that fence and that's the fence there next slide and again looking at the other way towards those trees towards the rear keep going that's looking back towards the existing building 
And again, back towards that, that property that's adjacent, keep going. That's looking from the property back towards the hard surface play space. And again, back towards the properties to the left-hand boundary. This is an aerial photo just to show the extent of the hard surface play space. This was, was taken some um, time ago and you can still see the markings for the, the play space. Um, in, you'll also note that the, the properties on Goodwood Avenue. You'll also notice the property adjacent on Batten Hall Avenue and also the I think which will be referred to um, later by um, representations is the eco house you can see um, a little bit further to the rear of the property uh, adjacent in Batten Hall Avenue. Next aerial slide. And that just shows the context of the, the site in terms of the grain of the surrounding area and the area of hard space. Next slide. Thank you. The site is partially allocated for green space. Next slide. The principal use of the development of the site has been established through the 2017 planning application. And it, that previously involved the conversion of the building and provision of development to the rear. And those are a few sample slides from the previous application. The current application seeks to propose an alternative proposal, which includes the demolition of the existing building and the creation of a care community through the construction of 47 apartments and four bungalows to the site. Next slide. The site is partially allocated for green space. The principle of the use has been established. Next slide. The conversion included additional development in the green space and the replacement of the hard surface areas with landscaping. Next slide. And that shows the layout of the previous approval with the conversion, the building to the rear and the um, development and the landscaping. If you go to the next slide. Thank you. Although the current application increases the built footprint by approximately 9%, it has been designed to maintain a spacious layout that complements the character and grain of the surrounding area. Next slide. Enhanced landscaping and biodiversity benefits have been included within the latest scheme that will lift the quality of the green space, particularly when viewed against the existing situation. Next, we've got three landscape slides. There's the first um, of the slides showing the built development and the landscaping areas proposed. Next slide. That shows the, the front of the building and the, the um, frontage building with the entrance way and that horseshoe area for parking. Next slide. And this just gives further details in terms of the swale and the pond areas and the biodiversity enhancements that will be provided. The use of the green space for this type of accommodation was fully accepted in 2017 as appropriate development in accordance with policy 38 and this current application raises no circumstances that change that position. Next slide. The design of the buildings has been adopted and has adapted key components of the existing and surrounding buildings, but set in a modern context. Next slide. It provides for a comprehensively visual complete building in contrast to a building that has been extensively extended. And this slide here, the top picture is what is now proposed and the second one is the contrast of what the the extant permission in 2017 and you can compare and contrast those <coughs> two the current proposal has less massing and height than the existing and due to its setback position the design allows for partial vistas of the building's frontage to be achieved when viewed from batten hall avenue next slide the size and the scale of the buildings, both of the frontage and those stepping down to the rear, as you can see on the slide, are an appropriate size and compatible to those that surround the area. Just got the, the main elevations now and we've got, so next slide for first elevation. So that shows the frontage elevation with the outline of the existing building. Next slide shows the side elevation of the um, block to the rear, which is stepping down and the bungalows as you can see, and also you can see the longitudinal sections that show the existing buildings compared with those properties on Button Hall Avenue. Next slide. 
that's just looking from the other elevation and again the other longitudinal section next slide and then back to the the frontage um, of the, the the front building next slide and finally to the rear the design is considered by officers as being wholly acceptable as a replacement building next slide the site is located within the Batten Hall Villas conservation area, but it is not listed building and it is not on the local list. The building has been fully surveyed and found to be in a poor state of repair. The opportunity to redevelop this site will allow enhancement to the conservation area through the re reuse of a redundant site and provide significant de design contribution to the area. Next slide. It is noted that the conservation officer and the con conservation advisory panel do not object to the principle of its demolition of the existing building. The CAP members being split with the design approach to be adopted for the frontage building. Next slide. As discussed above, the design has been carefully considered in the context of the surrounding area and from a heritage policy perspective, it is concluded that the proposal as a whole, including the landscaping and the hard Expanding areas will enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area and not result in harm. Next slide. The buildings have been suitably located, so not to not result in harm or loss of amenity to neighbouring pro residential properties through overlooking or dominating impact to their boundaries. The majority of the trees will be retained and incorporated into the new green corridor, which will also provide screening to the neighbouring properties. It is considered that the layout of the building will not give will give rise to no undue harm to those existing properties next slide as part of the ecological assessment bats have been identified within the existing building and have been utilizing the, the surrounding sites for feeding and foraging the design of the new building provides the opportunity to provide a specifically designed bat roost which will provide an enhanced environment for protected species Additional enhancements are also provided as part of the, the overall enhancement of the site, along with conditioned landscaping, which will include trees and, and plant species to encourage foraging and feeding of bats. This is an improved situation from both the current site and also the approved scheme, and which focuses not just on mitigation, but on enhancement. And it is considered to be, that the benefit is of great significance in the consideration of this application. The enhanced landscaping proposed and the tree retention across the site further adds to this enhancement of biodiversity. The design also includes green roofs and of native species within the design that provides an enhanced connectivity across the site for all species. So there is an overall positive impact on ecology and biodiversity that provides a significant enhancement. This also relates to the outdoor space for residents that will wholly be beneficial for their health and well-being. Next slide, please. Access and parking have been thoroughly assessed by the Highway Authority and found to be acceptable for the use that has been proposed. The additional justification of parking levels has been fully accepted, with parking now proposed being suitable level, taking account of the type of use and its location, along with the opportunities for sustainable transport. Taking account of all of these aspects, the access and parking provision are considered <coughs> acceptable and have, been, and have been found acceptable by the Highway Authority who offer no objections. Last slide, please. In conclusion, the proposed scheme provides the overall benefit to the provision of C2 elderly persons accommodation for the city through the reuse of a redundant brownfield site and the enhancement of the, the green space allocation along with the conservation area. The loss of the existing building within the conservation area has been fully justified and the proposed design is suitable replacement that enhances the conservation area as a whole. There are great benefits that can be secured for ecology and biodiversity through the proposed scheme and conditions providing connected wildlife corridor when none exists at present. The scheme takes a fully account of the access and parking provision that has been fully justified and found acceptable by the Highway Authority. Overall, the scheme provides sustainable development and is in accordance with the South Worcestershire Development Plan and the aims and the objectives of the National Planning Policy Framework. The application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions set out within the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, turning now to our speakers today. Sorry. Oh, sorry.
Apologies, Louis, I'd almost forgotten. Um, yes, we'd better hear from you first. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, uh, the officer says that it's care accommodation. I, I've got a feeling this, this isn't a nursing home, this is actually a retirement village, so I think it might be slightly misleading. Um, the existing planning consent is for a hundred dwellings or more, and of which four units, as I understand it, are occupied. And I think everyone in the room will be sympathetic to the developer that this does look like a difficult financial position that they're in. But I would really like to draw everyone's attention to the fact that our responsibility isn't to make sure that the developer can make their money, but it's to protect the local environment to make sure that local residents are not being disadvantaged. This is a big expansion. This is going from 32 dwellings to 51 dwellings. That is a significant amount. And the original consent was not really uh, contested significantly at the time because there was a significant amount of work being done in the mitigation work. But this is a major expansion of the planning application. If you look at the amount of built space, I'm sure that um, this will come up later on, the amount of built area within the, the green space is going to double from 12% to 24%. That's a doubling of the amount of space taken away from the green space. I'm going to raise a point now, which may seem a little bit superfluous, but I think it just sort of um, explains a point and, and, and develops an argument. And that is about things like cycling provision. Now, anybody who knows me from previous planning applications knows that I'm a keen cyclist. And if we want to achieve our um, carbon neutrality targets as a nation by 2050, we're going to have to do a lot better than we're currently doing in terms of planning our infrastructure. There are 47 dwellings that are apartments and four, uh, and four bungalows. So that comes to 50, 51 dwellings. So you can imagine probably around about 60 people perhaps being on this particular site. And when you look at the planning application, it looks like there's about four cycle spaces for those 60 residents. There are eight cycle racks for visitors and staff, which it may be reasonable. If we look in other countries, particularly places like the Netherlands, um, people well into their, into their 60s, 70s and 80s are still cycling. And in fact, 17% um, of people who live over, who are 65 or over in the Netherlands, uh, use a cycle on a daily basis. So that's Netherlands, but that's not in the UK. But if we want to build the infrastructure for the future, we need to make sure that future buildings have got enough electric vehicle points, enough cycling provision and so on. So I've got a question that I would have raised if I'd been uh, in the debate and questions later on, but I'm hoping that um, the county officer will be able to answer this question for your benefit. My question is that how were the four racks identified and is this really an ambitious target for cycling for the city i know there are, these are older residents but even people in their 60s 70s and 80s will like to cycle and four racks for 60 people does seem very un ambitious things are changing for cycling as well because there are more and more e-bikes and e-bikes extends the amount of people who will cycle in their older age now, I'm labouring this point a little bit because one of the things that we're, you're going to be discussing later on is about the loss of green space. And when you take away green space, you should be making sure that the rest of the development <coughs> is as ecologically and environmentally sustainable as possible. And the fact that something's been missed on the cycling, in my opinion, shows you that the ecological environmental aspects of this application may not be at the top of the developer's mind when they did this application. The next point I would like to raise is about loss of privacy. It looks like 
the plans are showing a number of balconies. The plans also show a lot of flat roof space. I'm assuming that the roof, the flat roof space is not going to be amenity space. Okay, good. But even so, the balconies that are on the side which face um, Goodwood Avenue, they are a significant concern to me and local residents because when you, uh, for the, those people who went on the site visits, I'm sure you will have noticed that the, 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 the land area of the site is quite significantly higher than the, the houses and the gardens that are on um, Goodwood Avenue. So already you've got an imbalance <coughs> between the, the site and the, and the nearing neighbours who, uh, who are lower. Now, when you look at standards for the amount of space you need between development and other people's properties, they may be reasonable, but this, site, this application has got balconies which further elevates those people and is a further loss and erosion of people's privacy. So that is a particular concern that I wonder whether some councillors may like to explore later on. But I suppose the, the biggest issue for me really is about the, the green space. Um, you know, what is the point of having green space, protected green space, if you then in planning applications don't protect that green space? Green spaces are not there just for biodiversity, but they also create light and space and a relief from a large urban environment being built up. We create a green space for a reason, and we should have very good reasons when we deviate and we start to nibble away and take away those green spaces. It seems to me that it's very, very clear in the planning policy that there are three reasons or mitigations you could use to allow you to build on green space. And each one of those three reasons, in my view, is not, is not given any weight or any sort of mitigation. And those three reasons that you would potentially allow yourself to, to steal some of that green space, or one is for a community recreational use. Um, and, and in this case, it's a private property. Um, so, you know, unless we're going to be planning to have let local residents go and use these gardens, I don't see that as being a, for community recreational use. Or the second reason would be for us that there is a surplus amount of green space in the area. I've not seen any evidence for that. And the third reason that you might take away green space is if there is an alternative green space being provided elsewhere. And again, I don't see that on the application. The planning officer has made a little made a comment about the fact that there are hard surfaces with the tennis courts. And it's true, they are hard spaces, but they are part of the, the green space. And they are a clear amount of land which is allowing people the space and light and to make sure that the area doesn't get overbuilt and overdeveloped. But I think we need to be really clear that. These tennis courts are not buildings. It's not a contaminated site. It would be relatively simple to remove those tennis courts. This is hardcore compacted and some tarmac on top. And so saying that it's lost, it isn't lost. This could be returned back to green space relatively simply. I'd ask councillors who are going to be taking part in the debate and also to the vote to think about if you are going to take away green space, how would you make sure and protect and make sure that this is being done to the highest possible standards? And one way of doing that would be that you would ask the developer to make sure that it complies with either a good or a very good or even outstanding level on the BRIAM standards. As far as I can see, uh, that isn't uh, been detailed uh, within the um, within the planning application. So I'm going to start to sum up now, and I'm sure you'll be glad of that, but um, this, is, this is a major increase. When planning applications go through, often they squeak through and they're just about acceptable. 
And it's very common for developers then to come back later on and say, well, ah, this has already been accepted now, and then go for a lot more. The original planning application that went in, in my view, shouldn't have been approved. But now we come to this one, and it's going up from 32 dwellings to 51. The amount of, of built up area within the green space is going to be increased from 12 to 24%. This is a doubling. This isn't a minor modification. Planning decisions are hard, but I'd urge all the councillors, I urge you to take the side of the environment rather than just taking the developer's word on this. I'd urge you to vote against the application and invite the developer to come back again with a smaller scheme that does not have loss of privacy that this will entail and that does not reduce the amount of green space. And that if it does reduce the amount of green space, it has some safeguards by complying with some standards such as the BREAM standards to achieve either a very good or an outstanding result. Thank you. At that point, I'll leave you to your deliberation. Thank, Thank you, Louis. So we'll leave you to exit. If I can... Well, or just... That one is. I, I'm assuming that if there were provision, every, that would be okay. Candy, you better ask it of our officers, if that's okay. I, I, sorry, I'm not asking the officer, Chair. I'm, I'm asking the council. No, I, I think it would be is, better asked of our officers, is what I'm saying. But he doesn't know what he thinks, Chair. I'm asking, it's a reasonable question, I think, is if, if there were cycling, forget all the other stuff, because that's we've got to deal with. But if, if there was cycling provision, that would take care of that element, would it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, turning now to our speakers today, each of you will have three minutes to make your case and we will time you. Uh, sorry, five minutes to make your case and we will be timing you. Uh, so, Mr. Andy Bayliss, would you like to speak first, please? Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, I've got copies of slides if anyone would like, in case anyone can't read anything. Okay. Actually, I, I think we already have copies of slides. Okay. All right. Um, so, my name is Andy Bayliss. I'm a chartered uh, civil and structural engineer. Um, a multidisciplinary project manager and a sustainability expert. Um, I've worked on and led pre several schemes similar to this uh, that's been applied for at the moment. I'm the owner of the Eco House, number 25 Batten Hall Avenue, um, and we are, which we bought, we bought the plot of 10 years ago, um, and we are objecting to the scheme on, uh, on the grounds of its, its overdevelopment within the green space. That's the Southwest Development. Um, uh, policy number 38. Just because a site has a low ecological value, it does not mean it has it doesn't have a high ecological potential, i.e. the tarmac is a very easy thing to, to get rid of. Uh, on our site, there, there's a history of planning refusals going back over the years where um, permission was not granted because of the green space, or it was then called the green network. We work very closely with uh, Planning, the planning team, Chris Dobbs, the landscape officer, and we, we finally agreed for our, you can see on the, on the slide, um, the, the two parts of the green space, our part on the other side, we agreed a 12% um, uh, area of, of build. We were very restricted in terms of the level of the building, and we had, to, we had no hard standings allowed whatsoever. So the, the site is 88% green, 12% building. Um, Next slide, please. For the consented scheme, I could see that similar discussions went on with the ERL team um, and, the plan and the planners. And basically, you can see on there, I worked out that the buildings are 
are about 13%, so almost the same as ours. So there's a consistency between the two schemes. Um, there were some extra hard, hard standings on there, but it was more or less reasonable. And, it, and you can see in the red, that's a large area of completely green space that can be wildlife corridor, meadow planting, trees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and during that application, I actually worked with the ERL team. We shared our landscape plan and we made the two sites almost joined together with how we were going to make the wildlife um, uh, meadows, et cetera, work. Um, so if you just picture that in your mind, and then the next slide, please. So this is the new scheme. You can see now what's actually left of the, um, the green space. And most of that is the bank. If you, if you went to site today, just sloping down to the buildings on Arundel Drive, there's a 72% there's a increase in buildings up to roughly 24, 22% uh, of buildings. There's, there's a lot more hard standings as well because of the extra buildings. There. So, so much of the green space has disappeared. Um, the, the design is not very considerate. The two bungalows you can see that are to the sides of the, and high, further down the site, they, they're higher, as, uh, as Louis mentioned before, than the Goodwood Avenue sites and our, and our property. And they will literally look straight into us and we will look straight into them. So I've no idea why you would place buildings there when you've got other space to put it there or, or not drop them to other levels. Um, there have been objections by 29 residents there's been an objective by the conservation officer, which was not mentioned before, it's on the planning portal. There was an objection by the landscape officer and by the local councillor. So all those objections are all on the planning, planning portal, so I'm not sure why you've not been told that. Um, the motivation behind the scheme is sadly financial. Um, the main site, there's permission over there for, for 100 units. After several years of development, only four are occupied. So they're, they're effectively bankrupt, it's very sadly. But um, we understand from the site manager that this site's going on sale. So if this is granted, then that's what I'm expecting, that it will go on sale and we may be sitting in another meeting like this in a year's time with a new developer trying to push the boundaries even further. Um, I think the, the changes over the year with the planning team has lost the history of this site. We've got just 30 how... seconds left. Okay. Um, the last thing to say is really there are... Um, Worcester is committed to the climate emergency, protecting Worcester's natural environment and enhancing its biodiversity. Those policies should be followed by this committee, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any members have any questions for Mr. Bayliss? No, no. In that case, Mr. Bayliss, would you like to resume your seat in the public gallery? Uh, Mr. Pegg, uh, would you like to give us your version? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm James Pegg. I'm a consultant to Enterprise Retirement Living, and I'm an architect with 25 years' experience with the retirement sector. Before I start to say what I was going to say, I think I should just comment on what Mr. Bayliss was saying about um, bankruptcy on the on the main site. Um, I don't believe that that is uh, something that should be considered for uh, when we are considering a planning application. Um, I also say that that is just rumour and that is not something that uh, that I can uh, confirm. So um, can we put that to one side, please? <clears throat> Sorry, it's taking up some of my time, but. Um, I felt that that was necessary to, uh, to respond. But I would like to explain, and again, Councillor Stephen said about um, developers coming back again once they have achieved the planning permission. Um, I'd just like to explain why we have come back um, and why we have submitted a revised application. During the time, that, or since the time that we achieved planning permission for this site originally, a number of factors have come to the fore to influence our decision to come back with a revised scheme. Um, not least the fact that in 2019, the retirement sector was hit badly 
by the COVID epidemic. And this highlighted our responsibility as operators to ensure the well-being of our residents. This was a really particularly difficult period for us and thanks to the efforts of our staff, we've had no deaths from COVID in any of our retirement villages. However, as part of the precautions taken, um, our residents were confined to their apartments for long periods of time. And it was then that we um, recognised the need for all apartments to have private external space, terraces, balconies, together with good daylighting. This became essential um, because um, people needed to feel a connection with the outside space, even though they were confined to their own apartments. This, of course, led us to a review of what we had um, achieved on the original planning application and a review of the existing building. And it was evident that um, the existing building could not provide the balconies or external spaces that are essential uh, for the scheme that we're looking at now. And this is a development of our thinking, development of thinking within the industry as well. So after careful consideration, we decided that the only way that we could provide the apartments with balconies, uh, good sized windows and natural ventilation was to demolish the existing building and replace it with the new building, as you've seen in the scheme. In addition, the new design benefits from a better internal layout. It, improved, <coughs> it gives Im it improved access for all, for all, particularly wheelchair users. Modern standards of insulation and energy use and avoids the inevitable compromise that would result from a conversion. This new building is on the same, approximately the same footprint as the consensus scheme, although its mass and scale is slightly less, as the officer commented on previously. Whilst its design is not a pastiche, it is of high quality and the use of gables and other features echo the existing. The, the next factor that led us to, uh, to change the consensus scheme is our experience on the main site. And that is, that's shown that there is a demand and a need for more affordable apartments. This will give a greater number of elderly people the opportunity to join the, the Mount Batten Hall community. And to achieve smaller apartments, the rear buildings have been redesigned. They retain the stepping down of stories as the original uh, scheme and, and continue with the principle of green roofs on the flat roofs as we step down. I have 30 seconds left. Mr. 30 Peg. seconds, okay. Um, in addition to that, we have um, increased the distance from the boundary by two meters to the side boundaries. So it's improved overlooking rather than detracted from it. Um, the other point, which is I will cover very quickly is that um, Obviously, material prices have risen, so we have to take that into account, and we have to be conscious of the, um, the economy of the development. We need to be able to achieve a certain number to achieve that, that uh, 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 income from that, uh, that site. So that's, that's the, uh, the case for uh, ERL. Thank you, Mr. Pegg. Before I ask members if they'd like to ask you any questions, uh, I'd like to point out, I should point out really, that the uh, developer's financial status isn't a matter for this committee. And the, uh, any approved application, should this one be approved, for example, um, it would apply to the site, but not to the developer. Another developer would be at liberty to implement the same uh, approval, if that were approved. So now to members, any questions for Mr. Pegg? Andy, yes. Thank you, Chair. Just arising from, from what was said uh, about uh, privacy, um, what is the purpose of the, the, the flat roof? Is that to be a circulation area? The, the flat roofs, uh, which are actually green roofs, no, they are, they are just uh, to be retained as green roofs. There would not be access for the from the apartments to those green roofs. Um, the only access is for maintenance of those roofs. Thank you, James. Chair, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you mentioned in your in your presentation uh, the question of the footprint. 
Uh, I know that the details contained within the document, but just for the simplicity of, kind of clarification, um, what are we actually talking about here in, in, in real terms? I know you were you actually mentioned it through your presentation, but what is it in, in real terms? Yeah, when I talked to Footprint, I was referring to the the replacement building for the existing building. Yeah. Um, uh, the When I again refer to Footprint, it was referring to the consented scheme and the footprint of the existing building is um, in fact uh, um, slightly less than the consented scheme. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Pegg? Yes, Mark. Thank you. I, I am concerned about the distance between um, the bungalows and and um, the nearest property, the eco home. You you will you you do have to admit that there's been quite a, a significant reduction in that distance of the closest closest home to the eco house. Yes, the bungalows are a new addition to yeah. the uh, to the proposal. And they are closer to the eco house and they're closer to the other boundary on the other side. Um, what we've done is to keep them as low as possible in terms of um, uh, story heights, so the single story, i.e., bungalows. Um, and also, we have taken into account that the eco house faces into the site. Um, we are looking, so it's facing away from, from our site. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that everyone? Yes, so Mr. Pegg, thank you very much. Would you like to resume your seat in the public gallery? Uh, before we start the debate, I think it might be as well to clarify some of the questions that came up, such as the, uh, the development of green space, the overdevelopment of green space that was mentioned. Uh, and the conservation officer objection and the size of the footprint generally because i think it's in the report but it will be helpful to clarify um thank you chair happy to do so in terms of the consultation comments um the conservation officer's comments are set out within the report um i've got nothing further to add he 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 i could read it out but members can read that for themselves he doesn't specifically object. He talks about um, the change of design um, and he talks about the, the best part of the building is just its facade. Um, in terms of the um, landscape and biodiversity of landscape officers' comments, um, members will have seen the late paper. Um, and again, I don't need to say much more than that. He has no objections based on the, the latest scheme. Um, and particularly around the landscape proposal and the, the details concerning biodiversity. So again, um, I've got nothing further to add in terms of that. Um, in terms of the overall footprint and the built space, I just refer members to paragraph 7.19 and the table below that, because I think that's quite a useful table, which sets out um, the previously approved application. It sets out the current proposal and the existing situation based upon the existing buildings and the, the area of hard surfaced areas. I don't think, I think that is quite explicit in, in terms of its, its provision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, right, members. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I've got some questions and comments, if I may. Um, I am concerned about the loss of green space. Um, you will recall uh, an earlier question I posed to Mr. Rudge, um, and I've seen it in, in, in my own division uh, ward, um, where there is certainly the start of a process, it seems to me, of uh, if a house has a big garden, then demolish the house and plonk loads of flats and bungalows and houses on it as much as you can get. And that's very bad because normally that is not in keeping with the local area. It's just, what I'm saying is just because you can do it doesn't mean we should. Um, just because there is green space doesn't mean if we can get away with building on it, we should. Because green space is there for a reason. 
Um, and which comes on to my second point about the demolition of the house. Um, just because we can demolish it because it's not listed doesn't mean we should. Uh, I live quite near that area, so I went to, uh, I've seen that property. Um, it is a beautiful house, actually. Um, and I think it's convenient that it just happens to be in a condition where the best thing is to knock it down. Uh, it reminds me of another application elsewhere, uh, where a house was in good condition, but still this committee decided to allow it to be knocked down and, and plonk it with nine houses up by, because they wanted to use the land, having knocked the house down. So I think this is something we need to look at very carefully, Chair, when we consider these things. I recently was, uh, read a book, Worcester, Then and Now, and it's quite amazing, the, the buildings that got knocked down and destroyed, usually for some ugly monstrosity, which we then want, hopefully will fall down, then we can put something nice in its place. So, you know, we're coming full circle, it seems to me. We've got nice houses, knock them down, doesn't matter, use the land, build on it. It's quite wrong. And I think we want to watch that trend. Um, the officer said about the design, and he said he was very happy with the design. Well, in the nicest possible way, all I can say to that is he hasn't got very good taste. Because if you look at the um, aerial view and you look at the southeast elevation, uh, it looks like a 1960s factory to me. I mean, absolutely featureless, but still, you know, and the proposal is to get, get rid of a nice building and put that in its place. Um, the other thing is sustainable. Um, of course, we, we always bung, bung this word in, don't we, to make it acceptable. But I don't accept that because I don't think nobody, anybody can define what they mean by sustainable. So perhaps the officer can explain what he means by this development being sustainable. It's bigger, it's gonna be denser. The people living there are gonna use gas, electricity, water, all the utilities. So don't say on what basis it's sustainable. Once land is gone, it's gone. Once you've used up bricks and steel and glass to build it, it's gone. So I don't know what's sustainable about it. Um, the, the next question is viability. Now I knew this would come in somewhere as well, because it always does. And of course, inevitably we were told, well, prices are going up and therefore we've got to increase the density, we've got to increase, take, away, take more land and so on and so on. Yes, that is true. Uh, equally, you can put the prices up. Um, it's all to do with market forces, supply and demand. So if the price of raw materials is going up, you put the price up. And if the people don't want to pay the higher price, then you don't build them. You know, it's, it's not our job to facilitate the, the economic prosperity of a developer. Um, but as for viability, well, the times we've seen that. And, and really my final point, Chair, is I wasn't going to mention it actually, but Councillor Stephen provoked me. Um, and it comes back to the question of, of parking and, and highways and transport. I'm sure Ms. Hanshaw thought she was going to get away with this one. Um, but uh, obviously on the parking, um, uh, in paragraph 7.65, it, it says that 89% of the required standard is met. So again, it comes back to an earlier point. If you've got a standard, then why don't we stick to it? Um, I don't see what is so special in this case that 89% of the standard is okay. In other words, we haven't got a standard at all. Um, I do accept in, on this occasion, um, parking is, is not gonna be a huge issue, so they might be able to get away with it. But according to Councillor Stephen, if, you, if you've got all these 80 year olds cycling up London Road and Battle Road, if they're gonna be doing that in, in their 80s, then surely they'll be still driving. So if they're still driving, then the car parking space is going to be very important. Um, and, and, and really, and he did, bless him, he did compare it to the Netherlands. I have to say, Chair, and this is important on, on this particular location, this is one of the highest, steepest uh, locations you can get. I mean, even fit teenagers can't cycle up London Road and Battle Road. Apparently these 80-year-olds these eight are going to be charging up there because they can do it in the Netherlands, which of course is as flat as a cake. Uh, but but there we are. Um, um, and he talked about um, cycle spaces, therefore, for this, this huge demand. Well, I mean, is it going to be like the cycle spaces in the Guildhall Carl Park, which are mainly empty, or the cycle spaces on Fourgate Street, which are mainly empty? You know, where, where is this demand? Um, and Karen, Ms. Andrew, perhaps you can comment on the ones out at the Guildhall and the long Fourgate Street, all covered, all nicely done, empty completely empty. But anyway, there's apparently there's this secret demand that's going to suddenly hit us uh, for part of a, And the other and the final point chair on this is, again, 
put, I do understand Ms. Hanshaw putting in the word sustainable, because obviously that's the magic word that gets you planning permission. Um, and she talks about public transport. Um, I walked past Mount Battenhall, Battenhall Mount, which is, you know, just, just down the road there, almost every day of every week. I can honestly say, in all honesty, I've never seen anybody cycle in and I've never seen anybody cycle out. Come to think of it, I've never seen anybody walking in or anybody walking out. It's completely car dependent, that. I have no problem, Chair, with it being car dependent, but I think we should be honest about it. It's going to be car dependent because of the nature of the occupant. In other words, people aren't going to be walking, they aren't going to be cycling. Um, they aren't going to be going by train. The only public transport available to them is a bus. And as Ms. Hanchett will know, the only bus that goes anywhere near there is the 26 stroke 27, which is not hourly, it doesn't run on a Sunday and finishes at about half past five on a weekday. So I don't know what good that's going to be. Sometimes I use it because I'm getting to be a bit of an old fart myself. And normally on the bus, yes, <laughs> and not, but normally on the bus chair, you get about three or four other passengers at most. I can tell you, they get off of Camp Hill Road and the two stops on Battenhall Road. They're not going to Battenhall Mount. So that imp in indicates to me the experience is that these kinds of residents are not going to be using the bus. They're certainly not going to be walking. It takes 25 minutes to walk from there to the, to the Guildhall. They're not going to be cycling up London Road unless I've missed something. So, and they're not going to be catching, doing the bus. So it's going to be car dependent. So the yeah, point I'm making is if it's going to be car dependent, so be it, no problem with that, but let's make sure there's sufficient car parking provision. Um, that's it, Jill. Thank you, Alan. Trenchant as always. Sustainability, as you know, has three tests before we go any further. Social, economic and environmental, and they're all in the report. I mean, I don't know if, if you want to comment on that, Mr. Round, before I, I turn to, to Ms. Hanson. Yes. I'm happy to do so. Um, through you, Chair. Um, Councillor Amos, um, I, the MPPF um, summarises what um, sustainable development is, and it takes the, the definition from the Brundtland Commission from 92, which essentially says that it's meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. That's sustainable development. But as the chair has rightly said, in a planning sense, there are three dimensions to sustainable development. There's the economic, the social and the environmental elements. So in terms of the planning decisions and the reports, they will be structured in that way. And that's where it is set out in, within the report. From an officer's point of view, we feel that this development is sustainable development based on what the framework tells us. So I won't, won't pursue that point. But, but frankly, Chair, the idea that this is sustainable, which is to say it's not affecting the, the future, that applies to any house anywhere, really, doesn't it? Because once it's built, it's built. Uh, as far as transport sustainability goes, I think we'll, we'll turn to Ms. Hanchett now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can't comment on the cycle parking at the Guildhall or Fourgate Street, and it isn't relevant to this application anyway. But there has been a lot of discussion about cycle parking, and I feel it would be appropriate to answer the very the specific question or the query from Councillor Stephen. So this is a difficult planning application because it doesn't really fall into one of our use class classes easily in that it's not uh, the, the, one of the use classes within our parking, our adopted parking standards, because it's not a nursing home and it's not sheltered accommodation either. The developer is proposing 12 cycle parking spaces, and that does happen to accord exactly with the parking spaces that we would seek for sheltered accommodation, and that is the higher of the two categories. So we have therefore accepted that that level is appropriate. However, I would uh, point members to condition 16 um, on page 49 of your report, as this specifically relates to cycle parking. <laughs> And it states, prior to first use of the development hereby approved, cycle parking shall be provided within the curtilage of the site with details to be submitted to and improved in writing by the local planning authority. These facilities shall thereafter be retained for the parking of cycles only and demand for cycle storage will be monitored through the travel plan. And you will note there is a further condition requiring a travel plan. So we believe with the provision proposed and the imposition of the condition relating to cycle parking and the travel plan, that that is sufficient for this planning application and that is, ad and that is adequate. 
in relation to car parking, car parking has been calculated based on it, it's a split site, so it's the total spaces across the two sites. And I think it's 137 spaces for the 157 <coughs> units. And given the information that we've been provided on by the applicant in terms of the age profile of the local residents, we believe that that is adequate provision for this development in this location. Uh, I, I think, thank you, Chair. Just want to clarify from Ms. Hanshit that she actually thinks we're going to have 12 people cycling up and down London Road and Battle Road to get to this premises. Of course, I can't do it. Uh, my nephew can't do it. Uh, but these 80 year olds are, I mean, they shouldn't be in this property if they're that, that fit. They should be out training for the Olympics or something. Well, I used to be able to do it recently, and I'm 69. So, you know, just let everybody know, <laughs> come clean about that. But we did have um, an 80 year old hall keeper who used to cycle to work every day. It wasn't up a huge hill, I agree. But uh, as Councillor, uh, um, yeah, Louis Stephen mentioned, I mean, there are such things as um, electric bikes these days. Yes. Um, Andy. Yeah, I, I, do you want to say it's a shame we've been sidelined in a way by cycling, as important as that is, because I, I, because I think the residents have got a genuine concern. And I think part of their concern is based on um, definitions. They they don't want to leave, lose an open aspect, uh, and so it's reasonable for them to know what the the rules say. Now we've got a, an excellent paper, and it, it does cover some of those things that were said weren't in here. But but at paragraph seven fifteen a seven one five, it it gives the three principles on which uh, uh, affect green space. And green space, it says, includes a range of private and public open spaces associated with community facilities. And there they are. And then it goes on, and this is where, I'm, I, I'll be honest, I'm lost on this one. I've read it through several times. I read it before I came. 716 then goes on and highlights that the term green space as used by the SWDP, uh, that's a local development plan, is not to be confused with local green space in the national uh, plan. Um, well, I'm confused. <laughs> and I'd, I'd be very grateful if Mr. Rowan could help me. Thank you, that's a, that's a really good question in terms of clarity. Um, the, the MPPF uses the frame local green space, which is defined very specifically as a specific designation. Um, and from, for members who were here for the um, five year land supply discussions, one of the elements that trips um, a tilty balance out of a tilty balance is a local green space designation. We haven't got any within South Worcestershire, and that's why the clarification is put within the report as is just a green space allocation, not a local green space allocation. And you'll notice within the revised SWDP, it is now changed to, I think, um, green space and ecology um, designation so that it's grouped together rather than just making it a local green space. Hopefully that's helpful. Come back, Chair. Um, so the, the, the three, the small one, two, three, under 715, are they relevant in this case? And then if I may ask two questions at once, because they're sort of allied. Um, Mr. Rand knows that this, this council has got a policy about biodiversity. And later on, it says that um, it, it, it basically it won't have a, 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 a negative effect on biodiversity. Would you expand on that a, a little? That's, so two questions. One is that one, two, three, um, are they relevant in this case? And the other one, um, is there to be an impact, a, a negative impact of significance on biodiversity? Um, again, thank you for the question. Um, yes, policy 38 is applicable um, and has been applied. And as you read through the report, it is concluded that in, in consistent fashion of the previous application, 
that this application is considered not to have an impact in terms of policy 38. In terms of ecology, um, there is, as we set out within the report, there is a maternal bat roost within the existing building. The proposal is to provide that within the new building in a larger space, in a better provision, um, so that it's not just that bats are able to access that, it's specifically designed for bats, so there will be a betterment in terms of the maternal bat roost. There is also additional enhancements across the site in terms of other bats and birds, foraging, feeding in terms of the landscaping. So overall, as you'll see from the landscape officer's comments in the late papers, we are satisfied that actually it provides not just mitigation, it actually provides enhancement for ecology, particularly with reinforcing those corridors that are lost because of the, the hard surface area. One, if I may share just one, one more, thanks very much. I do understand it. If, um, and you know, we're still in debate, but if, if we did approve it, is there anything we can do to mitigate the concerns about lack of privacy. I know it's not a material planning condition, <coughs> but would it be appropriate for there to be a condition about the uh, use of the flat roof or is that uh, OTT? Um, through you, Chair, um, obviously privacy is a material consideration for us. Um, and you'll see set out within the report the distances that are between the balcony areas and the rear gardens, which is approximately 12 and a half metres, which is adequate from a, a planning standards a point of view. Um, in terms of the flat roof areas, um, they're not to be used as, as um, areas, but I think you're probably going a little bit further along on the agenda, and it certainly could be an additional condition that could be added to restrict the use of those flat roof areas for um, use for sitting out, etc. And um, it would clarify that they are to be used as green roofs only and only to be accessed for maintenance purposes. I think an additional condition with that would be useful. Would you be happy with that added to the, the application, an additional condition on that? I'm so decisive, Chair. I'm not at that point yet. Okay. Uh, but I'll listen to what everybody else has to say before. Fine. Bill and then uh, Jenny and then, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think some of the plans went up on the screen for the, the layouts. Um, I can actually ask this question. Um, I didn't, I'm not sure what, what makes this uh, a so called retirement village, unless you can be clear about that. I mean, are, are there like communal areas available inside the building? Through you, Chair. Um, in terms of the communal areas, I think as it's been um, said previously in the, in the debate, it is a split site. So there are communal facilities that are at Mount Batten Hall, which will be used as well. Um, so the retirement uh, village element is that there is a restriction in terms of the occupation, which you'll see within the conditions, which is for ages 55 or over. Um, but also it will be, there will be communal facilities available both with, uh, on this site and also on the adjacent site. Could I just ask then additionally, are any of them designated as affordable? I, I guess not. Um, they're not and specifically within the SWDP there is a policy that says that C2 uses will not um, contribute towards affordable housing. But Jenny? Right, starting with a comment. Um, we're told under 6.1 that um, it, the building, as far as the Conservation Advisory Panel is concerned, is not acceptable in its present form, which obviously we've been told that the Conservation Officer says it's fine, but um, I just want to um, note that, that it's very clear from what they say, they've got some problems. When we visited this morning, um, there was a lot of infilling in the area. When we drove down Battenhall Road, it was clear that a lot of new buildings had gone up, but usually the host building remained and there was sort of bits down the side of it or behind in a lot of cases. So the actual in initial villas under the Battenhall Villas conservation area were being recognised as being important. And I quite like that area 
having its distinct <coughs> identity with the black and white work on it. I worry about the um, modern expression of an old building, especially the space in the middle of the building, which is glass. It's a great big, tall, two story or possibly more piece of glass work going through the building as far as I can work out. And that doesn't seem to be in keeping with um, this, any of the buildings nearby. And I'm not quite sure that why that was a design feature. I'm also concerned that as a 60% increase from the last iteration, going from 32 to 51, well, it's 59 point something, but near enough 60, which is quite a big um, expansion of the um, plans. On a plus side, I, no, I've been into the uh, other building, which is fabulous. Um, Mount Batten Hall has been beautifully restored. And I th I'm disappointed that this building is not being considered for restoration because the quality of the work done elsewhere means that if they did do it, I'm sure they'd do a really great job. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, moving on, Marjorie and then Lucy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm concerned as well about the increase in size from 32 to 51. Um, it would have been great to see, I, 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 I'm not, um, I'm okay with the existing building going, but I, but I would much have rather have seen a similar size of development at the back of the, of the area. As, as we had in the 2017 application. Um, I do think that um, the tennis courts are a bit of an arid area. Uh, admittedly, you know, I have, uh, I have to agree that according to definitions, they're part of the green space, but nothing much is happening there. So I, I welcome the, the improvements in biodiversity that will be gained by taking, removing that hard standing and the hard standing will go if um, would have, would go in the previous application as well. Um, I think there ought to be provision for the storage of wheelchairs and motorised wheelchairs. So I think, in fact, it's far more likely that the residents would would use um, a motorised wheelchair than, than they would jump on a bike. Um, it's, okay, so that's 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 me for now. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, Lucy. Thank you. Um, i just like to just um, take a minute to talk about the heritage of the site. Yes, um, it's not listed in any way. And I can see that, um, I can see the pros and cons for either keeping it or demolishing it but really if it if if it is to be demolished then i'd like to see something about what it what the building was used for incorporating actually in the scheme um and whether or not um something can be done about the actual heritage of the building the memories and that sort of thing um, incorporated in some sort of I don't know a mural or something like that so that um, anybody can see that actually yes it was a school and that sort of thing you're losing an interesting point yeah and James <coughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I think Councillor Hodgson makes a particularly relevant point there. It's certainly not unknown for this to take place. It needn't necessarily take a, a particularly large footprint within the building itself for that to, to occur. And I think to retain that link with the past would be really, really something we could applaud. So I'm fully on board with that. Uh, I just wanted to 
return briefly, if I may, to the, the, the question of cycling, because it, it, it's, it's a very brief point. But it, it, it's referred to in the paper that the demand for cycle storage will be monitored um, through the plan. Now, monitored is, is a word we all use on, on numerous occasions, and it, 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 you know, storage of data, and periodically we look at it and, you know, make, uh, <clears throat> you know, representations to various people about what should happen and so forth. Is that robust enough? In other words, if um, the the residents here do not, um, you know, fully align with Councillor Amos's point about uh, whether or not they're going to jump on cycles or not, is if that demand is monitored, is that rigorous enough that we could return to it and say, look, there's 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 actually something else here that we need to look at. Uh, we're not simply just going to stay with the the existing number because uh, I think that's quite an important sort of thing that, that should be built in. Uh, and I also take the point that, that Councillor Bissett makes about uh, motorised vehicles. I think it's a good one. Uh, clearly, a range of, of uh, modes of transport will be used and that should be built into the proposal. Thank you, James. Do you have a particular proposal out of all that? I, I would like to, to, to echo uh, Councillor Bissett's point. Which I think is a, is a good one. Lucy's again. I would second that, so to speak. Uh, but I, I would like a, a piece of work done to define exactly what we mean around the paragraph referring to cycle demand. Thank you. Okay. Um, through you, Chair, I can I can do um, two of those points, and then I, I might, I'll refer across to Karen in terms of. Um, um, cycles. In terms of wheelchair storage, um, again, that can be an additional condition, if members so wish, that details of storage areas for wheelchairs and motorised wheelchairs are submitted to and approved in writing. Um, and in terms of um, the interpretation of the historic building, um, Again, that is something that is a very good point and can be included as a condition. Um, things could be interpretation panels, they can be the use of salvaged materials of the building um, within the interior of the building. So certainly a condition to be able to um, exercise the developer's mind on that and get a, a scheme for us is certainly something that can be as an additional condition if members so wished. And I'll pass over to Karen in terms of cycles. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I think it's also worth noting that um, within the um, submitted transport assessment, it does identify within the plans uh, storage for mobility scooters. So that is already taken into account. So whether the vehicles, the electric wheelchairs could be in, in that same place, I just thought it's worth pointing out because that's where some of the secure cycle storage is also going to be. Uh, we believe that in, um, in fact monitoring via the travel plan we believe that's that's robust enough the travel plan will have to be submitted onto um, mode shift stars at business um, and we will monitor that ourselves so we believe that that's appropriate it's not for the developer to monitor we, we will take control of that and if they're not reaching their targets then that's when we can intervene um, and ask that they um, provide further cycling but I'd like to think that they wouldn't need to be monitored that they would see themselves that there is a demand there and that they would automatically increase that but if they don't that's something where we would jump in thank you um obviously oh, sorry chair yeah, just for clarity um obviously we've got to produce so many dwellings a year to um accommodate citizens are these dwellings within the um, proposal going to count towards those? Um, so you share, uh, they do count towards it, but not in the full amount because they are C2 uses. The way that the land supply um, calculation is done is it's one in eight. So it's that percentage count towards so there is a boost of supply but it's not a hundred percent it's one in eight instead yeah, 12%. Yeah. so that is a factor to consider in terms of the boost of housing but it's not a full as you would <laughs> no. so for further clarity if these weren't retirement properties um it would be a hundred percent but because of the age range being targeted we only get one to, yeah, okay. 
Thank you. Uh, e scooters. Yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't be practical. So, and, and the point you wanted wanted to take on board the point that Lucy made about heritage uh, in the design side of it. Uh, and I don't know what we would suggest, but perhaps we could negotiate that because design is usually a reserved matter. So, would you be happy for us to to take that on as a condition and then work it out with the developer? Some of the history and also um, some of the materials as well may be incorporated. Through you, Chair. Um, obviously, members, there's no motion on the table at the moment, so we are talking a little bit theoretical. Um, but in, in terms of the conditions that we have discussed as part of the debate, um, there are three conditions that members have discussed one the use of the flat roof second wheelchair storage with charging points and three a heritage scheme for interpretation to show the um, connection with the previous use duncan Thank you, Chair. Um, if it assists committee at the moment, I just thought it might be useful to sort of recap where, where, you, where I think you are in your debate. Um, you've heard from the speakers today, you've heard from Councillor Louis Stephen. Um, some of the debate has been around matters of principle um, and concerns have been raised around, I've summarised them as overdevelopment for the site, loss of green space, adverse impact on heritage matters and concerns about the contemporary design. And that uh, sits alongside the report that you have in front of you from your officers recommending uh, this as an acceptable scheme. You've then got part of your debate so far this afternoon that's looked at detailed matters um, and matters that might be addressed by additional conditions. Um, so in, in terms of uh, reaching a point this afternoon where a, a motion is put on the table, um, I, I, hopefully that's helpful in terms of matters of principle and matters of detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I mean, Mr. Rudger, I think it's done a fair summary, but I think there's a fundamental issue as well that, that some members have raised, which is about the the demolition of the property itself, which wasn't part of the original application, um, which is a big issue for, for, for many of us. Um, and personally, I really would regard it as an act of pure vandalism. Um, so I think it's sad that we're now talking about putting a plaque up to say, this is what we destroyed, because that's in effect what we're going to do. And I think that is very sad. And I think, as I say, I do urge the committee in the long term to consider these issues, because it's one after another these beautiful buildings that we're knocking down for things that, that, that aren't appropriate in that area and we've got to if we if we as a planning committee chair don't look after our heritage nobody else will because they're either left to to, to, to decay and then the developers will say well it's decaying we've got to knock it down if they'd looked after it in the first place it wouldn't need knocking down and i don't believe for a second this is in a state where it needs to be knocked down so I think that is a fundamental issue for, for me and I think other colleagues as well about that. And I, I, I don't think that should go unsaid. Thank you. I think one of the problems is that it's not listed, even though it's in a conservation area, it's not even locally listed. Uh, so maybe that's something we've overlooked in the past, whether or not we wanted to do that. But we are where we are. Um, Duncan, yes. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, forgive me, when I uh, summarised those matters and mentioned heritage, um, I did mention conservation area, but it, it's within your planning judgment today to decide whether you consider the building to be a non-designated heritage asset. So not statutorily really listed, um, but still of sufficient local value um, to lead you to a particular decision this afternoon. But there are a number of issues there that you need to balance up this afternoon. Um, 
the officer recommendation set out in the report and the other matters that you've heard this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, and I think the other thing I wanted to comment on was the green space, because although the hard standing is within green, you know, green space area, it isn't exactly what you call green space, is it? So anything which improves that has got to be good. And uh, I was quite impressed with what the, the, the improvements that were suggested, the enhancements, because I think they generally would enhance uh, the biodiversity that is there. Um, other than that, I don't think there's very much I want to say that hasn't been said already. So what I'm going to do is propose the officer recommendation with the suggested commission, the conditions we've just heard, and just test what opinion is in the room. So you'd like to second. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Those against? Two. Thank you. Then that is carrot. Sorry. Any abstentions? I don't think there were. Oh, sorry, Marjorie. <coughs> I'd missed you out. My apologies. So that's carried. Thank you. What I'm going to do now is I think the debate sort of started to flag, didn't it? What we need to do, I think, is take a short break. Uh, Ten minutes, come back at five past, have a cup of tea, get comfortable. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Myself at your feet. I forgot to make a declaration oh. on the on the um, fairway. Yeah? Mm. Uh, I'm a member of the neighbourhood plan committee, which is mentioned in the report. We, the haven't, discussed, right. we haven't discussed we haven't discussed the application. Yes. Well, you better if you give me. I'm going to say so. Yes, of course. I'll say. I'll call you to say that before we discuss it. I know. I understand where she is. Yeah, yes. yeah, very. It was a tough one. Very difficult. Well, I think on the whole, it is. I mean, I don't think it it really does enough towards heritage. I mean, the gables are really not enough of a quotation, are they? So Lucy is quite right. I mean, I think we do need a bit more of a gesture that direction. And I, it is disappointing that that building is being pulled down, there's no question. Yeah, yeah, it is. But if it is going to be knocked down, you might have suggested perhaps it's a super site for 50 affordable houses. <laughs> I don't think we'd have got them. I don't think the, the economics, you know, the finances would have added up at all. <laughs> that chat was a, a pretty outrageous, wasn't it, talking about it? Yeah. 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 The one, the one big day, it was it day, the one who said they'd go and put it on the back. Uh, Oh, yeah. yeah, don't trust this. Yeah, right. I do, well, yes. yes. You, oh, you, you put him right. You know, yeah. But uh, I feel that be said publicly. You, got you, got you can't let somebody get away with saying that. Yeah. And then when you give the results, yeah. just share well, there you go. And I think you know the answer. It's like people who do their weekly shopping by car instead of by car. But we have to make this though, don't we? No. But we can't continue this because we can't continue everything has to be done. But Carol, when cars go in next year, people will say, I'm going to go by car because I'm not polluting anything. Yeah, it's like a stick of gesture, aren't they? So, you know, they still use that the same amount of space on, on the road as other as other well, well, I think I think we'll have to have words. Well, it's a six and a half. So, 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 so,
Okay, on which I'll the, the, the fairway. All right. Will he declare? I'm going to declare it at that point. Exactly. Well, two covered monstrosity. No, one, but one's a covered monstrosity. It looks like it's monstrosity. The other is an unknown monstrosity. So whether it's covered or unknown monstrosity. Can you tell me how many pipes? Well, it's not an issue. And then if you've got one more, there's a guy there. Turn that and go down four pieces. So all these guys need covers. It's done up. It's done up. Well, it's okay. Outside, you can always bank them out. Just walk down there. You've got two lots of covered Seven <laughs> and, and then, then when, you, when you've got the answer, perhaps you just email. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I feel a bit better anyway. How about you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, isn't it how some debates lack energy? Yes. It, I don't know. It was a, it was a, wasn't it? Oh, there, there aren't that many of us that might be something to do with it. I was actually having a one point in the I thought it wasn't. I wasn't sure. Yeah. yeah. It looks as if it could go the wrong way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, folks, if you can sort of grab your tea and your, your biscuits. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Hello, dear. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. Sorry, Pat. Oh, yeah. Right, are we all ready? Okay. Okay, item nine on the agenda uh lucy yes thank you and i believe andrew you've got something Indeed, to say yeah, thanks very much um I, i'm a member of uh the wonder villages wonder villages Warnham parish neighborhood plan committee which is mentioned in the paper we've not we've not covered this this thing but i ought to also say that i've spoken or i've been contacted by several of the um the residents in this area that i've studiously um held my own counsel as it were and not made a, a free decision or made any comment uh, moving on to the application itself then Right, and it, we're trying this once more, members, see whether we can get it moving. 
Oh, sorry, Margaret. I'm going to try once more. Is that... Sorry, Margaret. Did you just cl click on the PDF rather than the PowerPoint? Yeah. Is that... Is that that one? Yeah, I'll, yeah, just start that, just start that again uh, uh, from the slideshow. Yeah, that's working. Magic. Thank you for our technical support over there. Um, so, members, this application relates to land at the fairway, which was originally part of the Tolodyne Golf Club. The land is open grassed land that slopes down towards the public right of way. The site is allocated for green space in the adopted local plan and also within the latest consultation of the local plan review and you've got the two um, areas identified there. And whilst it was noted that the site was previously included as part of a wider housing allocation reflected in the draft neighbourhood plan, the previous approval to the north of the site has fulfilled the housing numbers for the allocation and therefore this site is no longer required to be removed and you can see the difference between the two is that the developed site by platform housing has been now removed in the revised SWDP from the green space but the application site is retained. To the south of the site is the wider open space and the public right of way and to the north and to the east existing housing and there's the public right of way. Approximately two-thirds of the site is affected by a tree preservation order. The application is submitted in outline with access to be considered in detail at this stage. Just a few photos of the site. So that's one looking from within the site and you can see the platform houses um, being constructed. That's looking the other way across the sloping site. Um, and then just some photos taken from the visual impact assessment this is taken from the public right of way and you can see down at the bottom the map showing where the location of the, the photos is. So this is take, taken from the public right of way as you come along Toledine Road. This is looking back towards the site and if you keep the, your eye on the um, large set of cypress conifers, it's a good indication of where the centre at the edge of the site is towards um, the, the fairway. Um, and again, that's going a little bit further up. I think it's Leopard Hill um, as, as you're going around this, the former golf course. And that's looking back towards the site. And that's just showing the entrance to the site, which is between the um, existing property in the foreground and the new properties that are currently being constructed in the, the background. And just a couple of aerial photos the application site is in the centre. I did try and put a red um, mark around them, but actually it, it got rid of some of the vegetation and it wasn't quite as clear in terms of what's on site. So but you can see quite clearly. And again, um, just in the wider area of green space and the application for that. So this application proposes six dwellings on the site with access, access taken from the fairway. In respect to the principal, members will be aware of the council's position on five-year housing land supply as set out within the report. And whether it is taken individually or collectively, the council cannot demonstrate that it has a five-year supply. As a result, it, is, it will be understood by members that paragraph 11D of the framework is engaged that a tilted balance should be applied. This requires decisions to be approved unless adverse impacts of approving the application significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. And we've discussed before that clang in terms of the, the scales. In respect of, of the, this development, the development will result in the loss of green space across the whole of the site without meeting any of the criteria within policy 38. From a visual perspective, the landscape analysis demonstrates that there'll also be a loss of visual character to the wider area a dilution of the social and the environmental benefits of the overall space. No compelling justification has been put forward that would outweigh this harm that would result. The indicative layout also indicates that the development would result in loss of TPO trees. And 
you'll see that the, the green lines, so um, everything south of the green line and to the east are within the tree preservation order. And those trees that are indicated from T4 downwards and the group of trees, they'll be removed as part of the development with some trees, maybe G6 being retained, but the majority of them will be removed as part of this scheme, as well as those outside the tree preservation order. Any landscape scheme that may be submitted as part of any reserve matters application would, in officer's opinion, be unable to adequately mitigate for the loss of these trees. The trees play an important amenity value as part of the green space and their unjustified loss will result in loss of amenity as well as loss to biodiversity. From an ecological perspective, the ecological assessment highlights the impacts of pollution and disturbance to the local nature reserve, which is shown there as the Rogswood Hill Meadows Local Nature Reserve. And you can see that the application site actually creates a buffer between the consented approved development and the, um, the nature reserve, and hence the allocation for green space. <coughs> it is considered that alongside the loss of trees, the overall impact to ecology and biodiversity would be such that the required level of mitigation and enhancement could not be met within the site. The scheme does not also demonstrate that measurable gains to biodiversity as required by the National Planning Policy Framework can be met. Whilst it is accepted that the access can be provided to the satisfaction of the Highway Authority and that details matters of layout, parking and scale could result in no adverse impact on neighbouring properties, highway safety, drainage, and also sustainability credentials of the building, the principle of developing part of the green space is unacceptable in principle. When taking the planning balance then, members, the harm that would be created as identified in the reasons for refusal would be significant and they are demonstrably um, that they would clearly outweigh any social, economic and environmental benefits that would flow from the development. Even without a five-year housing land supply, the development cannot be supported in the view of the harm that would be created. The application is recommended, therefore, for refusal for the reasons listed within the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions from officers? Jenny. Um, could you confirm whether this proposal would reduce public access to the green space? Um, through you, Chair, no, it doesn't affect public access. It is purely private green space, but from, from officers' perspective, it contributes very heavily to the visual appearance of the space that members of the public enjoy from the public right-of-way. Uh, Andy, yes. A technical question. Uh, I, I do thank Mr. Round for being uh, so um, positive, as it were, in his paper and in his, his delivery. There's no, no ambigu ambiguity there. But my question is, when something, we are a council that values green open space. We, we know that uh, where it's a, it can be provided, it has benefits, health benefits, social benefits. Also, we're a council that um, values biodiversity and why would we not recognize the uniqueness of this area where in, in the middle of a city you've got cows uh, cows one doing what cows do so my question is with all that has been said at what point is it decided that this should be heard by this committee rather than dealt with um, uh, um, in, in, in the tone that you've uh, done your report um, through you, Chairman, the, the current constitution as it's written in terms of the scheme of delegation for officers requires that any application that would be um, or seen as a departure, if approved, should be heard by this committee. So whether it's for refusal or for approval, it should be um, considered by this, this committee. Now, that may be something that members want to take as an offline conversation, but that's the, the reason. And of course, it was you, you asked. You also called it in if it was to be approved. So we felt, given the sensitivity of it, um, that officers should be aware that um, sorry, members should be aware that officers are taking these decisions seriously and not just approving everything at planning committee. 
any more questions or speakers? Well, if that's the case, I'd like to propose the officer recommendation. Thank you. Uh, those in favour, please. Thank you. That is uh, refused. Uh, item 10. Thank you. Laura, would you like to present this application? Thank you, Chair. If we could just have the presentation. I think it may need to be uh, on the PowerPoint like we did with um, the most recent one. Um, so this planning application seeks to vary condition two of a uh, previously approved application 19 forward slash 00409 forward slash FUL. I'd just like to draw members' attention to the late paper, uh, which addresses a further representation received from a neighbouring property uh, that was received following the publication of the agenda. Um, specifically, condition two of the previous application relates to the approved plans condition. Um, planning permission has previously been approved at the site for the erection of a single detached dwelling house adjacent to 220 London Road, along with associated highways works. The current application proposes various external alterations to the dwelling and the erection of an external staircase. Uh, a number of these changes were previously sought under an application for a non-material amendment, although this was, however, refused as it was considered that the proposed changes were not non-material in nature. Um, so therefore, we have this application now for section 73 uh, for the variation of condition. The accompanying report covers all the relevant issues and is taken as read. Um, I'll just move on to the slides now. As you'll see, the first slide just shows the location of the dwelling uh, with the front elevation of the dwelling fronting Cromwell Crescent Lane and the rear of the dwelling fronting London Road. As some of the amendments have already been made to the dwelling, we do have the benefit from being able to view the dwelling as built. The following slides just show some photographs taken at previous site visits. Uh, as you can see, this is the rear of the dwelling taken, um, taken off London Road. As you can see, the previously approved fencing and balcony area um, on the dwelling there. Another view there from off London Road. Uh, now, uh, looking at the frontage of the dwelling, uh, this is taken from Cromwell Crescent Lane itself. Now, just looking towards the side of the site with the front door in the foreground. Um, the break in the power pit wall that you see on the roof there um, with the ladder leaning up against is where the proposed staircase is proposed to be sited, although we'll get onto that um, with the plans in a minute. Um, now this just shows a side parking area to serve the dwelling um, with neighbouring properties 45 Cannon Street and neighbouring property Lindhurst in the background there. Now looking back at the front of the dwelling um, from further along Cromwell Crescent Lane. Uh, now looking towards the entrance of Cromwell Crescent Lane with um, the existing 220 London Road, the white rendered dwelling on the right. Now looking at the parking area that serves the existing dwelling at 220 London Road. And again, another photograph, uh, this just shows the level differences between the dwellings um, on the opposite side of London Road. 
Uh, this, uh, this slide just shows a photograph taken from a garden area of uh, neighbouring property, 45 Cannon Street. Uh, now we're moving up onto the roof terrace itself, laid with artificial grass and white rendered parapet walls. Um, looking at the view from the roof terrace now, with the outbuildings of 45 Cannon Street and neighbouring property known as Lindhurst in the background there. And again, a further view of the parking area from the roof terrace uh, with the outbuilding of 45 Cannon Street on the right there. Uh, now a view from the other side, uh, looking towards um, the existing 220 London Road, um, a white rendered dwelling in the foreground. Uh, now looking off the roof terrace to the frontage of the dwelling and the neighbouring property, 41 Cannon Street, uh, which is a detached dwelling uh, straight ahead. Um, now moving down to the ground floor of the dwelling, uh, this slide shows um, the corner balcony that was previously approved under the original planning application. This uh, faces the elevation uh, fronting the existing 220 London Road. Uh, and again, another view just showing um, off, off the balcony itself. Now moving towards the rear of the dwelling, um, this just shows the, uh, the proximity of the dwelling to London Road itself. Now looking at the block plans, um, previous, previously approved block plans are on the left there and uh, the current proposals are on the right. As you can see, uh, changes here include the removal of the roof light um, that's shown on the left plan and uh, the erection of an external staircase access. Uh, now, just looking at the previously approved and proposed floor plans, I know, I know they're quite small, um, but we'll, we'll go on to the changes. Um, now, looking at the changes to the east elevation, uh, this is effectively the rear elevation facing London Road um, that we saw on the previous photographs. As you can see, the changes here include um, changes to the window design, siting, and some of the fenestration changes to the materials. Um, and the external staircase on the left-hand side there. Now moving on to the west elevation, uh, this is the front elevation we saw facing Cromwell Crescent Lane. Changes here include the design, again, the, the design, um, sighting and, um, of the design and sighting of the approved windows, changes to the fenestration again, um, some changes to the front door itself, um, and the installation of an external staircase to provide access onto the roof and the installation of uh, obscurely glazed balustrade on the roof terrace that was um, that was requested by officers um, this has since been increased in height at the request of um, councillor stephen to mitigate some concerns of overlooking to assure that the ensure that the total height of the balustrade and the existing parapet wall is 1.8 meters in height uh, now, now just moving on to the north elevation, changes here again to the windows and fenestration um, and, the, and again the installation of a glass balustrade to the roof. Now moving on to the south elevation, changes here include um, the removal of ground floor windows, um, ground floor window, sorry, um, and the erection of a new timber cladded wall. Um, this is designed to reduce any potential overlooking from the external staircase as this will be sited behind the, um, the timber clad wall. Um, concerns have been raised with regards to whether the dwelling has been constructed in accordance with the approved plans. Um, the overall dwelling has however been checked on site by the planning enforcement team and it was considered that the size of the dwelling is in accordance with the previously approved plans. The number of, a number of objections have been received from neighbouring properties. Um, these predominantly relate to the use of the roof as a roof terrace, overlooking parking um, and the impact of the use of the roof terrace on, on noise in the area. Um, the concerns regarding the use of the roof terrace are noted. However, it is useful to mem for members to note um, that the approved plans did include a parapet wall to the roof um, a roof light and an internal, internal staircase that provided access onto the roof space. Um, the material section of the application form did also make reference to the use of uh, decking as a material on the roof. 
um, and in the absence of any conditions restricting the use of the roof terrace, it is therefore considered that the fallback position is that the roof space can be accessed and used by the occupants. The, stair the application now seeks to provide an external staircase which provides external access to the roof terrace. We have now, under this application, been able to negotiate the inclusion of privacy screening on the roof terrace that was previously not proposed to mitigate the overlooking concerns. So it is therefore considered um, that the current proposals result in, in somewhat a reduced impact in terms of overlooking than the scheme as originally approved. Um, the condition has, a condition has also been recommended to ensure that proposed privacy screen and wall is, in, is installed prior to the first use of the roof terrace uh, and thereafter maintained, as well as a condition requiring the submission of materials um, and a lighting scheme for any lights proposed on the roof terrace itself. Um, so, just to sum up, for the reasons set out in section of seven of this report, it is considered that as amended, the amendments, are, the amendments sought are acceptable in terms of the impact on design, appearance of the dwelling, and do not have an unacceptable impact on neighbouring residents' amenities. Thank you, Chair. Laura. Uh, Louis, I, th I think I need to come to you first on this one, don't I? But could you be as brief as possible, please? Okay, um, I think this is a, another example of a, of a difficult planning application that just about squeaks through and then the developer comes back for a second bite of the cherry. The original application was bitterly opposed by local residents due to the large number of uh, properties that are very nearby and the loss of privacy, but also because of the narrowness of the lane um, and also the loss of privacy from things like the balcony um, and views of the cathedral and so on. The, the planning application, as you see today, might seem small, but it changes something very fundamentally. The original application shows a roof light, and most people, myself included, and I know all the local residents, thought this was just a flat roof with a roof light. It then, I think, filled everyone with horror that this now is highlighted as being a roof terrace and a roof guard. You, I think you've probably seen from the photographs how close all the other properties are. And, you know, a property in terms of a garden would be bad enough. But the fact that you've got something on top of the roof gives you a massive uh, ability to see into other people's gardens and, and into other people's properties. The original application made no ex explicit reference to this being a roof garden. And the access was via a hatch. Um, you know, the loss of privacy from the neighbours' gardens is one thing. But as I say, a rooftop terrace is completely different. I believe the developer has offered in good faith to improve the privacy by adding a frosted glass balustrade, and that is appreciated. Um, but I have discussed this idea with residents, nearby residents, and the majority of local residents don't actually want the balustrade. Um, it is a very tall building already, and they fear that it's going to be even taller with this additional height on top. So I'm going to sum up now, but and I, and I know that planning decisions like this are hard, and I did, I'd like you to vote against the proposal. If that's not possible, I ask that you to use this committee time to agree some conditions that will go some way to support and mitigate the problems that are going to be experienced by the local residents. The things I would like you to consider in the conditions would be that you drop the idea of the balustrade, that you introduce some reasonable conditions on lighting and noise levels but also to tie down any future uh, potential permitted development rights to build up higher than existing structure so that we don't actually end up with something, again, another nibble, another increase in height. Um, so that is all I wanted to say. Um, as I've said before, I will leave the, the meeting now and let you deliberate. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Admirably brief um, and to the point. Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, it's the third time we've, we've, we've dis discussed this. Um, and I, I, it's, not, a, it's not, not something that will be formed part of my decision, but I, I merely make the comment that wouldn't it be so much easier if people simply carried out the planning permission that they were given um, in, instead of getting it and then coming back for something else because they didn't think they'd get permission for that in the first place. This is exactly what's happened here. Um, we have four pages of amendments of changes to the original planning commission. Um, I don't think it's a particularly attractive building, but that is, that is just my view. Um, there seems to be a lot more the smaller windows, frosted windows, which I don't think enhances the visual, visual amenity for anybody else, but be that as it may, that's probably not strong enough to refuse permission for it. But what concerns me uh, is there is a clear loss of privacy, of overlooking. There's no question about that. Um, and I listen to the residents as I always do, because they're the ones who are gonna be affected, not us here. And they think there is a loss of privacy. If, if could I just, uh, if you could uh, indulge me, Madam Chairman, um, if we could, could we have a look at the two pictures which show the, 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 te the terrace, please? Um, because as Councillor Stevens said, they're pretty wide ranging at that height. There's really nothing you can't see. Um, probably you'll see the Morven Hills from there, I would guess. Um, that's it, just before, is it right there? yeah, there's, just before there, that's it. That's, that, that's the one, yeah, the, the, and there's one before that, if I may. You see, look, you're, you're, you can see into those people, people's gardens in a very intrusive way. And there's no question about that. So if you can just go forward one or two more there. And you're, again, you're, you're right looking into people's gardens. It's not just over a fence, it's from above. And they've completely lost their privacy. And I don't think that is acceptable, frankly. Um, you, 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 I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loss of amenity for existing residents. And I've always take the view uh, that you have to take account of the uh, loss of amenity on local residents because they are there they're going to suffer this permanently it's quite clear that this property was developed with a view where the the, the roof terrace was a, was a central feature of the property that's why they've gone up so high and this is why despite the amendments the, the one thing that hasn't changed is anything to do with this roof terrace and that's 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 what they wanted and i think that on its own makes this un unsuitable because you're already very high up so I think it's a shame that um, people can get or try to get planning permission in this way um, by not asking for something they want, but just doing it by really attrition, isn't it? You just change it and then you don't get what you want, you come back again. And if they don't have this, then they'll come back with something else until we give in. Um, but I think we've got to dis discuss this on the basis of planning reasons. And I think the overlooking makes this unacceptable. Thank you. I'm going to come back to Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I would wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Amos in terms of those pictures that there is a, a significant loss of amenity. Um, but what I would point out and refer you back to Laura's presentation is that that is what has been approved. The access to the roof terrace is already a part of the approved plan. What this application gives us the opportunity to do is to mitigate that harm to remove that overlooking by the application of privacy screening to that terrace area. So I would agree absolutely that there is a loss of amenity, but that is the approved scheme. What Laura was standing and taking pictures of is what, what this council, unfortunately, has approved. What we are endeavouring to do by this application and take the opportunity that, yes, they are making amendments, but we have negotiated significant betterment to ensure that residents are protected and that we have the opportunity to do that. If this application is not agreed by this committee, those opportunities will be lost, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, that, that, that is helpful. But uh, could Mr. Round then just confirm that um, in terms of what we've seen and the overlooking we've seen, can we not um, put some more protection on that? Because clearly the whole point of this roof terrace is to overlook other properties and to see as far wide as they can. So, so surely, uh, could we not put uh, some more frosted glass up on the top so that it will prevent the overlooking? Because technically that would be possible. Um, that is part of the proposal. 
So the proposal will include a 1.8 metre high frottage screen across the whole of that roof terrace so that there will not be any visible properties that be able to see. All that you will be able to see is above the 1.8, which will be the city views and the cathedral beyond. So just to just indicate then on, on those two slides we've seen, just what that would actually mean in practice, because um, Yes, that's it, for example, there. So are you saying there, there would be a 1.8 metre? I just wanted to clarify that the, the 1.8 metres in height is, is combining the parapet wall. So it would be the overall privacy element to it would be 1.8 metres. But that includes the wall that's already there. So it's not the glass that's 1.8 metres, it's combined. I just right, wanted so, to so make sure. So I'm a single person, so just on top of that, how much higher will the, the glass be on, on top of I the I think, Alan, got. you'd have to be standing on tiptoe yourself to see over the top. That is the element of the frosted glass. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just trying to establish, uh, Chair, uh, that from what the, the, the slides have shown what there is, um, I understand the officers are saying, well, there's going to be some more frosted glass on top of that. If there is, then that would obviously protect the privacy of those other properties. So, so how much of the top that we've seen of the terrace there, how much higher is the frosted glass going to be? Because then it means the residents won't be able to see over which, which raises questions about whether they are going to be very keen to do it. But as far as we're concerned, how much higher is it going to be? Um, on site, the parapet wall is approximately 500 high. Sorry, it's it? about 500 millimetres high, so it's about half a metre high. So it would be um, a 1.3 metres. But the, as Laura says, the total will be 1.8, which is six foot. So we're looking at a, a total height of a six foot screen which from the views that we that you identified, which I agree with, that will actually protect those properties from overlooking. And that, that, that then, Chair, would be, would that be a frosty glass wall, as it were, on top of the, the top of the terrace that we've just seen in the corner of the photo? It sounds to me as if what it will become is a solarium as you get in the Mediterranean rather than the viewing point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could you show us the floor plans again, please? <laughs> That's it. So could you indicate where the hole in the roof is at the moment as that they're having to get through to get onto the roof? So the previously approved scheme, if I just show you on this plan, can you see that um, the, the roof window on the left there, can you see that roof light in yeah. the centre, almost in the centre of the roof? That is the current access onto the roof. And if I go onto the floor plan itself, um, can you, uh, on the plan on the um, top right, can you see there's a staircase um, just sort of central to the plan? Sorry, sorry, I don't have ability to point, I don't think. Oh, I do. No, it's just below that where my pointer is, there's a, there's a staircase there that act, provides access onto the roof. The staircase is still to remain, although I believe that the 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 um, set of stairs that goes up to the to the actual roof itself is is not to remain. It is just the external staircase. 
Right, so they're actually going to take out the existing staircase to the window that we protect. Is that right? They're the going to actually in stairway to the roof. Sorry. I think if I can help, critically, they're going to remove the roof light. So whether the internal staircase is there or not makes no difference because they won't be able to access the roof from inside the property. It will purely be the external staircase only. My reason for asking was obviously if you're trotting up through the house and popping out through the ceiling, if you like, that's one endeavour. Whereas just nipping up an outside staircase is a much easier thing and creates a you no know, if I would think if I saw a planning application where somebody was going up through the middle of the house opening a window when it's raining or whatever to get out there that's not a very attractive proposition whereas actually just nipping outside and going up the side um, makes it much more usable space through you jet uh I agree in terms of the frequency of use, but it's not a covered stairwell. So in terms of popping out uh, internally, you know, uh, it would be um, in inclement weather, you'd be more likely to do it internally than you would externally because you've actually got to physically go out of the front door and up the, up the stairs rather than literally being protected while you're inside. But we admit that the um, staircase um, will include um, increase the frequency perhaps of the use of the terrace but the critical thing from our point of view is that the the terrace was there as part of the approval and what we're trying to do is is protect residents from overlooking right. is that the case did we actually give approval on the basis that there was a roof terrace um, as set out within the presentation there's access through the roof light um, there is decking which is approved as part of the materials to the the roof so whilst it wasn't explicitly put uh, as part of the the application it is certainly there as part of the application and we did there was no condition to restrict that use and you'll recall back to the Batten Hall Avenue application that it was mentioned in terms of restricting those use of flat roofs so it is very critical that conditions are applied in that way so we are where we are and as Councillor Amos has pointed out there is significant overlooking issues and we're trying to remedy that Thank you for that. Um, right, so we go on to the glass panel of 1.3 metres on top of a 0.5 metre wall. So that, at the moment, it's quite a solid looking building, very square, very, you know, if I was looking out onto it, I would feel quite intimidated in certain ways. And there are gonna be even less windows to that property shortly. We're then making it even taller, even though some light will go through the opaque panels. So, um, how I, I'm just concerned that it'll be an absolutely massive thing in front of people, and that we've added nearly a meter and a half extra of glass, which um, may make the situation worse. Um, through you, Chair. I I don't disagree. Um, the increase of the height um, is not something that we've taken lightly. What this committee needs to do is balance the, those concerns in terms of design against the concerns of overlooking. And what this committee has been presented with today is an application that's been approved, which I think has been highlighted that there is some difficulties with that. And what is now proposed in terms of, yes, we can remedy it, it may end up with a situation that in terms of design it's not something that ideally we would have supported but actually does the benefit of securing privacy to residents you balance that against the the design aspects purely professionally i think having the lightweight design and it will be set off the the um, balustrade and whilst it be attached to it it will be it will be a diff separation distance I think it can cope with it. And I think from a design point of view, yes, it will make it a little bit more prominent. But overall, in terms of percentage of increased height, I think that it, it is something within the realms of acceptability. And when taking into, into account the balance of the protection to residents, which I feel is, is quite critical and significant, that's where officers feel that the balance lies. Thank you. I mean, what we're trying to do essentially is mitigate the harm we've already caused by not spotting what they might do with the roof basically so uh
Chair, thank you. Um, I find myself in, a, in the not altogether common occurrence of actually agreeing with Councillor Amos on this particular issue. Uh, I, I have a, a great deal of sympathy for, for those people whose properties are being overlooked. I think it's a uh, one question I was going to ask, and to an extent it's been answered in the conversation, is what, if any, tools in the box we have with regard to open terraces of this sort, or maybe not so open terraces, depending on how the mitigation process works. Uh, I suspect from what was being said, not much, but then these are relatively unique examples of, of development. Um, so, again, at the point Alan made about this diminishing the value of, of this is, I think, a particularly good one. Because to me, if you're going to go down the road of having this, the opportunity, you know, there's a pretty serious um, outlook from that building across the city uh, in all sorts of directions. And, and I, can, I, I can understand the, the desire to want that, but equally I have an enormous sympathy for those people whose uh, properties are going to be impacted in this way. So, but we are ultimately, we're we still coming round to the fact that we are where we are. And I think we, we can't allow our, you know, we, we have to be restrained, constrained by that. Well, this application gives us the opportunity to try and mitigate the harm we've already done, in my view. Thank you, Chair. Um, are there any restrictions we can put on uh, concerning the use of the roof terrace then? For example, will people be prevented from putting up washing lines and things like that that might add to its... Uh, charm or not uh, through you chair it's certainly something i hadn't thought about but in terms of washing lines yes we can't prevent wash lines but in terms of um you'll see a condition in terms of lighting so um we are restricting any lighting unless it's submitted to us for approval um in terms of i think um, councillor stephen mentioned about permitted development rights there are no permitted development rights that would allow any additional height or any additional structures so in terms of that the, um, the existing legislation protects that in any event. So in terms of what we can do, we are trying to do the best we can in terms of restrictions. And I think lighting particularly, and yes, the summer months would allow use of it, um, but in terms of any noise or any disturbance, that would be a matter for Worcestershire Regulatory Services as a, a noise complaint. Are we anticipating them playing any music up there late at night or anything like that? I mean, we we don't know that. We can't surmise that. And as I said, that's a matter for Worcestershire regulatory services, and it would be the same in anybody's back garden. Um, you can't control what they play. It's not like a, a licensed venue where you can control amplified or, or live music. Yeah, I thought we could control it by condition. In terms of conditions, there's the, the tests that we have and in terms of reasonableness. Mm. Um, the officer's view is that it would not be reasonable to impose such a condition when there are other regulatory matters that can control that. But obviously, if members consider the five tests and they consider that it is reasonable, that it is relevant, that it is proportionate in terms of the application, it is something that they can consider as part of their, their considerations. Thank you, Chair. I think that's very helpful. But I, and I think on this occasion, we should, bearing in mind what Mr. Round has said, impose that condition, because increasingly we are granting planning permission for things, and there are consequential consequences, if I can use that tautology. In other words, we give planning permission, then there's noise or disturbance, then we tell people to go to another agency to sort it out. And if they're slow or dilatory, then they come back to us and say you're not doing anything because the, the public sees us as one authority not that we are planning but if there's a noise you go to worcester regulatory services and backwards and forwards because uh, because we're not joined up and i think in this case i'm absolutely convinced that the purpose of the terrace is for use if i could put it that way bluntly for, for social reasons and i would be amazed if that doesn't involve some kind of entertainment which i'm entitled to do but there has to be a limit on the noise because um, it's not it's not the same as as noise in the in the garden it's noise from on high 
I don't know whether the noise travels more from on high or, or, or less. Mr. Rao may be an expert on it. All I'm saying is as a precautionary measure, given the history of this application site, my strong advice is that we do impose a condition. Otherwise, you know, telling residents after the fact, we'll go to WRS. I don't think it's really fair on them. So um, I think what Councillor Amos was suggesting, members, and again, we're in the position where we've got nothing on the table, but an additional condition um, has been suggested in terms of no external live or amplified music shall take place within the property. Sorry, I ought to clarify. And the reason for that is similar to reason eight, to ensure the proposal preserves residential amenity in accordance with SWDP 21 of the SDP. Propose the recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Lucy. Those in favour, please. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Thank you. Any against? And any abstentions? Two. Thank you. Well, that is approved in that case with those con that condition. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I don't think I've got any other business from anywhere at this point. So that's the end of the day. Thank you, Thank you everybody, for your, your input. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs>